So most of the work that I do uh, is in fields that I'm not qualified for. Uh, I, am, uh, I do, however, have a degree in zoology. I don't practice it very much, but you'll see a few, I'll give you a few examples of uh, projects that we're doing that involve uh, animals. Uh, I think very appropriate for the setting here. Uh, so the title of this is A Zoologist. And I'll start with uh, a typical food. Uh, this is an Oreo cookie. And on their website, they, they, uh, they make sure that you understand that even though it is technically vegan, it does has, doesn't have any animal products in it, it is done in a facility where milk might contaminate it slightly. Um, so, so it's uh, kind of up to you whether uh, this is a problem or not. If, and, uh, but, but this is true for almost every vegan option. That, you know, for example, kale, lettuce, every, every vegetable has trace contaminations, not due to the factory, but due to the fact that life is complicated and there, there are caterpillars and worms uh, everywhere. If you removed everything on the planet except for worms, you'd still be able to see pretty much everything. Um, so there are worms everywhere. Uh, this is my, my daughter and myself uh, uh, with uh, little uh, uh, silk worms on, uh, on us. Uh, this is showing our intimate connection to at least a certain small number of animals. And so what is the effort? What is the kind of the scientific cutting edge uh, effort to, uh, to make it possible for everybody to be vegan? So there's two, there's two camps here, basically. One is to make plant-based foods that are as similar as possible to, uh, uh, to what you normally think of as meat. And the other is to take, is make actual meat, um, but not involving animals uh, in any way. Something that, that was derived a long time ago, possibly uh, non-invasively from an animal, and, it, and then it takes on a life of its own in a, uh, in a factory setting. I, uh, I, I am vegan myself, and you'll see in a moment uh, why, and, and why everybody's putting so much effort into this. And, 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 and what's happened is it started about 2013 was the first example of a, of a, of a burger that was made by manufacturing uh, from cell lines, from cultured cells. It cost about $330,000 as a... Uh, you'll see that one of my traits is I want to bring down prices radically, so this struck me as something that was kind of interesting. It's now coming down into the range of prices where it's competitive with uh, regular meat. And in, and in principle, it, it, it could be quite so. And it's sometimes called clean meat because if you streak out even the very best meat in a supermarket on a Petri plate, you'll get lots of, of colonies, some of which are pathological, pathogenic uh, bacteria. And this doesn't happen with clean meat because it's grown under sterile conditions. It has to be because they, they, uh, they won't, otherwise they won't get good yield. So why vegan? There, uh, you might know one or two vegans or you might be one yourself. You might know one or two reasons. Uh, there's a set of reasons uh, that have to do with medical. So for example, I I'm genetically have high cholesterol. My father more or less died of it. Um, had a triple bypass and then died. Uh, there are, there are some of us that are intolerant to lactose, so, so like you find in dairy products. Some of us are intel intolerant to a, a different sugar that looks a bit like lactose, that is present on almost all animal uh, cells, uh, almost all meats, except for primates. Um, so if you uh, eat primates, uh, then you're okay. Uh, but many people are, uh, have this intolerance. There is the issue of the energy that it takes uh, to produce a certain amount of uh, food. Typically, there's a, a five to one ratio, especially for uh, animals like beef, uh, the amount of energy you put in, the amount of energy that, that you can go into your body compared to plants, and about a five to one uh, ratio for water consumption. It takes a lot of water to grow uh, animal products. Uh, there are issues of uh, cruelty that bring up, and even in some cases, uh, 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 Faith-based communities uh, have, have particular uh, opinions about the, the animals um, or rules. There are zoonoses. These are, these are infectious diseases that originate or are propagated by, by animals, uh, and these include uh, things like bird flu, swine flu, HIV, Ebola, salmonella, mad cow disease. You've probably heard of these. And these are a risk the closer contact you are with animals. Now, 
Nobody here is in contact with animals, I'm sure, um, but you get my point. Um, and then finally, antibiotic resistance. Very often on farms, you use a lot of antibiotics, um, sometimes not even to cure diseases, just to, uh, to increase the growth rate. And, this, and, it, and it's a phenomenon that you can increase growth rate considerably just by antibiotics, whether they're sick or not. So, so it's, a, it, it's a pity if we, uh, if we can't uh, take advantage of some of these opportunities just because we lack recipes. So all of you should be creative about new recipes. Now I mentioned that some of us are allergic to meat uh, because of the sugar on their surface, and that also makes it very hard to transplant from an animal to a human. This is an idea that's been around for 20 years, but it, it was uh, very difficult uh, to achieve, bec partly because of the sugars on their surface, partly because of other immunological functions, uh, and partly because the pigs, which is the preferred animal, uh, has, uh, makes viruses. We have now solved almost all of these problems individually, and now we're putting together a combined uh, species, a, a combined type of uh, pig strain, which will have all of them solved at once. It's on the order of uh, several dozen genetic changes all at once, and this is due to new genetic editing tools that, that my group and others have developed worldwide, uh, such as zinc fingers, talons, CRISPR. And uh, the pigs are really an I ideal in that, that you can make miniature versions of them, large versions, you can get any sized organ. Uh, they're the right shape and, and physiology, um, and, and they will be human compatible. There's another opportunity with organs, however, which is that uh, we, if you're trying to transplant, you don't want them to succumb to the same disease that, get, that required a transplant in the first place. So if you have a viral infection that's causing your liver to go, you don't want to bring in a fresh liver and have it get the same disease. So you'd like the organs to be resistant to, uh, it's lovely, you want them to be re resistant to um, pathogens as much as possible. And it turns out that pigs tend to be resistant to most of the, many of the human specific, all of the human specific uh, pathogens. And there are many of them. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's, a, that's a plus. You'd also like them to be resistant to cancer and senescence, uh, maybe resistant to cryopreservation so you can bank them in, in uh, cold storage. And, and here are, uh, there are three, three animals of, of many that are so cold resistant that they can actually be frozen uh, uh, every year, and these include the tardigrade, the, the uh, certain uh, frogs, and, uh, and squirrels. So we use these as inspiration for developing better and better organs. Now, the o I mentioned you don't want them to senesce early, so if you're taking the organ from an animal that normally doesn't live as long as a human, you'd like to enhance its senescence, and this has been done successfully with mice. You can make them live twice as long, so that would mean that, that humans could live 160 years if that were linear. Um, the longest lived vertebrate, one of the longest lived vertebrates is, is this koi fish um, that lived 226 years. Um, uh, this is uh, our koi pond uh, in my backyard, and this is uh, me uh, hanging out with a koi in the middle of winter when, it's, uh, when the pond is uh, normally frozen. Um, it's not clear that uh, they're going to make it to 226 years especially with people uh, jumping in in the winter. Now, you can plot the, uh, how long an various animals live as a function of their size, because there is a relation, small animals tend to live less. Uh, um, but, but, but there's some outliers on this, some very interesting outliers, and we've done some research, like sequencing their genome and their RNA. And uh, these include the uh, capuchin monkey, the bowhead whale, which is the record uh, among mammals, which is, lives about over 200 years. And then the naked mole rat, which is closely related to other rodents, but lives uh, um, uh, uh, about 10 times as long. So instead of two years, it's more like 20 years. And we're inspired by these, or these uh, species and many other experiments that are done on aging. There's now a collection of about uh, 300 genes that are that where we understand them deeply enough, we understand how aging works, how to make uh, mice live longer, or even, in some cases, reverse aging. And so we're working on ways of reversing aging uh, in dogs, um, like this dog here, which is my 
my colleague who, who works on this named uh, Noah Davidson, this is his, his dog that he's raised from a puppy. The, pup, the dog's name is Bear, which I know is confusing because it's not a bear, it's a dog. Um, but anyway, we, we, we are, we're trying to take the lessons that we got from all these other animals, especially mice, and move them so that we can uh, make dogs uh, rejuvenate, essentially, and that's looking very promising. And if it works in dogs, we might try it in humans soon thereafter. Another thing we, we are increasingly capable of doing, and we have to have a discussion in, uh, as to whether we want to do it or not, whether just because we can, should we, which is we can engineer wild animals. We can engineer salmon, uh, it's just semi-wild. We can engineer uh, wild animals to become resistant to diseases that are plagues on humanity, where we're not hurting the animals, we're just making resistant to these diseases um, and at the same time saving humans. So, for example, malaria kills 600,000 people a year. Um, Lyme disease, probably many of you know somebody who has had a tragic reaction to Lyme disease. This can be a chronic disease. There's no vaccine for it. And many of the, many of the worst cases are people who have been treated with antibiotics and it has not um, succeeded. So we can spread this uh, these resistance through the wild, but we have to think very carefully about ways to contain it, biocontain it, and to make it reversible. The way this is done is that you can, the same kind of technology we use to engineer the, the, the pigs and the dogs, we can use to, to move through, say, the white-footed mouse or the mosquito that carry Lyme disease or malaria so that we'll spread 100% to all the offspring um, and will spread uh, very rapidly through these rapidly reproducing uh, animals that sometimes can reproduce in two months or less. So elephants, this is, this is my last story uh, and, and what we're trying to do to um, save this endangered species uh, or to contribute consciousness raising if nothing else. There are only 40,000 uh, Asian elephants left uh, worldwide, both in captivity and the wild, uh, 40,000 of them. That means we have uh, 20,000 female and even a smaller number of those female, which are of breeding age. Uh, this, is, uh, this is me hanging out with uh, Asian elephants, uh, Ruth and Emily, uh, over the years, over many years. Um, this is uh, more recently when we're working with the, um, one of the largest elephant breeding centers in Florida. Um, and uh, it's part of an a organization called Revive and Restore, a nonprofit that's it's aiming to, uh, uh, to change the economic forces to make it possible for uh, animals to avoid extinction, not just by uh, you know, forcing uh, governments to do this, but by figuring out how to get the economics right. This could be things like the black-footed ferret. It can be um, Asian elephants. And one of the things we're trying to do is extend the range so they can in inhabit ranges that they used to inhabit, um, but uh, something happened maybe, for example, 10, 15,000 years ago, we started killing off almost all the large herbivores in the tundra, uh, and this has huge impact both on the species but also on, uh, on our planet, and we'll come to that in just a moment. Uh, so this is, these are some of the team that, it, that have initiated this, including uh, Ryan Thielen and Stuart Brandt uh, and uh, uh, Bobby Dadwar and, and others uh, on this team. Now, one of the experiments in returning herbivores, trying to return them to their natural environment in the tundra, which, which is about 19 million square kilometers throughout Siberia, Russia, Canada, and Alaska, this huge amount of space that used to have many more herbivores than it has now, and, the, and the, the, tr the, the hunters and the trees have displaced these animals, but they could easily return. Um, in particular, the elephants have a, are, are very good at knocking down trees. They can knock down a tree in about 15 seconds. Uh, so there is a park there that's, uh, that's, that's growing in influence. It's called Pleistocene Park. It's a play on Jurassic Park, for those of you who have seen that. And Pleistocene Park, uh, it, they've already returned a number of uh, cold adapted animals, uh, horses, uh, musk ox, uh, the, the bison. Now bison is a very interesting story worldwide. It was almost completely extinct, maybe a couple hundred of them in the, in the world, uh, and now, they're, now their numbers are back up to a half a million uh, worldwide. And part of this is working on the economics 
where you can get a sustainable model for uh, uh, harvesting a subset of the, of the bison for, uh, in this case, low cholesterol meat. Anyway, Pleistocene Park uh, is the work of these, of these, uh, of this family, the Zemoff family, Sergey and Nikita Zemoff. Uh, they, they've uh, been kind enough to, to visit us, and I'll, I'll be visiting them in, uh, in Siberia later uh, this summer. And what they have there is these are two of the species that they've already introduced into this land that was, uh, had uh, uh, almost no large megafaunal uh, herbivores. Um, and, and they claim uh, that these, the, the, this particular breed of horses is uh, scary enough that it can scare away uh, these, these bison. So they, they cohabit that the, 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 they've, they've, their ecological models and experiments that they're doing that show the impact of these animals um, on enriching the environment, creating uh, a home for more species, lots of smaller species, lots of plant species, and importantly, keeping the temp temperature of the ground very low. So they, these animals will stomp on the snow in the winter so the 20 degree centigrade summer temperatures can equilibrate to the minus 40 degree temperature in the wind in the winter, but not if you have a big, thick, insulating layer of snow. So these herbivores will, will do that but they're impeded, they can't really do their job, uh, they can't do their job because they have these nearly impenetrable forests that surround their, their grasslands. It used to be there was a much higher ratio of grass to forest. The grass has the, not only the advantage that it encourages herbivores to, to stomp down the snow, but also to, uh, the grass is much more reflective in the summer. It will reflect the, the, the it will, efficiently capture the carbon, but yet reflect uh, a lot of the heat uh, causing sun. So it's, it's, its albedo is about two times uh, what the, the plants that are currently there. So the grass was a, ver uh, was a, was a much uh, better uh, ecosystem for our human purposes because it allowed us to get to, uh, to uh, lower temperature. And why do we want lower temperature in the tundra? And the reason we want lower temperature in the tundra is that there are 1,400 billion tons, gigatons, of carbon locked up not too far from the surface in the, in the, in the icy soil, and it's, it is melting very quickly. Now, this isn't something where we have to point fingers and say this particular SUV or this particular factory is responsible, because a lot of this is the responsibility of our ancestors 15,000 years ago that killed off all the herbivores, or at least that's one possi strong possibility. And we've got a, a, a positive feedback loop where the more uh, methane and carbon dioxide that we release from the frozen tundra, the, the more global warming, the more global warming, the more we're going to melt the, the tundra. And so just even if humans completely left the planet, um, there still would be this uh, crisis uh, where the global warming could go to really big extremes. And to give you an idea of how big that is, I said there's 1,400 gigatons of carbon at risk. To put that in perspective, there's only 100 gigatons that's the whole amount of carbon that we're worrying about in the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, there's about eight, 850 gigatons total, but the 100 has increased during, our, you know, during the recent human history. And, uh, and we only produce about nine gigatons of carbon each year from from worldwide use of fossil fuels. Nine gigatons a year, but there's 1,400 at risk um, if we don't stop the, the cycle of, of, of warming and release of carbon uh, from, the, um, from the soil. So I just want to end by putting this in perspective. We're not trying to spend money. We're trying to save money. We're, and, and as evidence I'll give you, this is uh, a little, uh, the evidence, the way that we are sequencing these ancient samples, like uh, uh, to get ideas for genes that could make these uh, elephants more cold resistant, uh, that method of sequencing mammoths, for example, is part of a, a larger effort to sequence your DNA. Um, and we've brought down that price 10 million fold. So from $3 billion for a, not a very good genome to $600 for for a genome which represents both your mother and your father in you. 
and we're trying to bring it down even more. We hope that within a year, uh, we should, we will be, it'll be low enough that we can actually pay you to get your genome sequence. It'll be l less, less than free. You can, uh, if anybody's interested, you can ask me uh, how we're going to do that. But the point is there are many ways that technology can bring down the cost of uh, engineering uh, both reading and writing DNA and uh, ecosystems radically. And so I'm going to leave you with that thought, and thank you very much.